Welcome to Agency Bites, a podcast for agency owners, hosted by agency veteran and coach Steve Guberman. Agency Bites is a podcast focused on delivering actionable agency information from agency experts in about 25 minutes. Why 25 minutes? Because who has the attention span for much more these days? And you can squeeze in a listen between meetings with time for a bathroom break or coffee refill before your next meeting. Welcome to Agency Bites, a podcast dedicated to helping agency owners thrive. I'm Steve Guberman from Agency Outsight, where I coach creative entrepreneurs to build the business of their dreams. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by one of the top experts in advertising agency space, a guy who I greatly admire in the industry of agency coaching, David C. Baker from Punctuation. David is an author, speaker, and advisor to entrepreneurial creatives worldwide. He has written six books, advised a thousand, more than a thousand firms, uh, and keynoted conferences in more than 30 countries. He co-hosts the most listened to podcast in the creative services field, Two Bobs, which I happen to be a big fan of. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Steve, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. It's maybe premature to say that because I don't know what you're going to ask, but yeah, yeah, you're in for it. No. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see. I, I, I reserve the right to retract that later, but yeah, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I don't know in all the content I've read and listened to of yours, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. You've kind of paved the way for you know, guys like myself who, you know, also, you know, want to be um, agency coaches, etc. You know, I'm curious what your background is that got you started with what's now called punctuation. Yeah, so I spent five years full time in grad school and it had nothing to do with this. And about halfway through that program, it was full time. We had kids. I was married. We had kids. I thought, you know what? I don't want to, I was already teaching at the graduate level. And I thought, I don't think I want to do this too many politics. It's like, this isn't, so I'm sitting at home thinking, okay, I want to finish my degree, but I didn't, I needed a new career path, obviously. So I'm sitting on the couch and I'm just flipping through the local newspaper. And I said to my wife, it's like, these ads suck. It's like, surely I could do better than that. And of course I, you know, I had no, I had never worked in an agency. I didn't know anything about them and I was making all kinds of really bad assumptions, <laughs> but that was the start just, uh, just on the couch, deciding to start an agency back then an agency was a very different thing than it is today. Mm-hmm. And, um, so fast forward then four or five years into that, I am a subscriber to a publication called creative business out of Boston. And part of the deal was that you got to ask the the uh, editor questions. And so I asked him a lot of questions and eventually he said, Hey, I don't like to do the financial stuff. Can you write some articles on that? So I did. And then, then one day he said, Hey, um, or I said to him one day, why don't you, why don't you advise your clients too? Why are you just doing this newsletter? He said, I don't want to. And he gave me two reasons. And he said, well, why don't you do it? And he said, I'll put, before I could even answer, he said, I'll, I'll put an ad in the newsletter. You just send me 10% of everything you make. And uh, people started calling right away. And so I think within six or seven months, I was doing this full time. That was 30 years ago this March. Wow. 30 years. Congrats. That's huge. Good for you. It means I'm old. It means you've got a lot of experience and, and have helped a lot of lives. So that's a, a really cool thing. Um, but yeah, we ain't getting any younger. That's for darn sure. Yeah. My parents um, were medical missionaries overseas. So I didn't live in the U S till I was in my late teens. And had no experience in the field at all. So my background, I'm a total mutt. I have no experience other than huh. starting my own agency. So, uh, I mean, that's kind of true for a lot of people in this field, right? Like, yeah. um, you've majored in something in college and your parents are just thrilled that you're not homeless at this point, that you have a job that probably has nothing to do with what you majored in or it was yep. some creative or design or something. So we all find our own path. Yeah, for sure. Um, And so now your son works with you. He does the M&A side. You do more of the positioning and auditing. And Mm -hmm. recently this year, I guess, uh, rebranded under the name Punctuation. Right. Um, That's the third one. Third one. Like I I could have picked any name back when, you know, I chose a domain name in 94 and I stupidly picked a really bad one that. (laughs) Everybody, like for SEO purposes, it just showed up as people misspelling something else, resources, and the company was called Recourses. 
And then I thought, well, I'm just going to fix that, change to David C. Baker. And then four years ago, my oldest son joined me and he's, he's running the whole M and a side of things. And so it's like, well, it shouldn't be David C. Baker we should change it. So that's the story of why. So now it's punctuation. I really like the name a lot. Um, it's driven by the fact that we were able to secure the domain name and then we just say, okay, we can build a company around the domain name. That's awesome. I'm sure the domain name was plenty cheap. So it made perfect sense. Yeah. Also. Well, it was yeah. 10,000 bucks. I thought that was pretty cheap, really. I was Actually, yeah. Surprisingly, punctuation.com, yeah. I would have thought surprisingly more. So all the, you know, you've worked with tons of agencies um, in the years I've been coaching. It's, you know, maybe, you know, a fraction of what you've, you've experienced, but I'm curious from your experience, what would you define as what takes an agency from good? Like, yeah, I'm running a shop. It's pretty good. You know, we've got some decent clients. I'm making some money. Uh, too great. And, and the, the differentiators between the two, good and great. Mm. I like that question a lot. I uh, My answer is not going to be all that sexy, but I think, I think the real answer is a combination of courage mm. and discipline. I would say those two big things right close to those would probably be self-aware to manage people well you can't pull this off unless you know how to build a team and you know how to manage them and they love working for you they love the field and so on but there there are so many folks running firms that are they have the information they have the knowledge they don't have the courage to make the right choices particularly around positioning and then others who just uh they just don't like the messiness of new business. And so yeah. they aren't disciplined around that. And I, it, it's interesting. It's always interesting to me to look across the landscape of agencies and to see the ones that are really successful. If we define that as they're making good money, they're doing good work for clients. They have a pretty good boundary around their business life and so on. It doesn't interfere too much with other things. Those are often the firms that you've never heard of. They're just, you know, yep. they don't enter award shows. They're just doing their work. They're happy and um, they're not famous. Uh, those are the ones that I'm drawn to, honestly. The humble under the radar ones, uh, you and me both. Um, I recently encountered an agency from out in California and blown away by their messaging. The fact that they stood out from just a sea of likeness from all these agencies um, really own their niche. I know you're a big fan of niching down and owning, you know, that, that corner of, of the world. And, um, and so, yeah, yeah, I, I like that definition. You talked about courage and I assume you're, you're talking about leadership as well as the overall agency. Yeah, for sure. So probably two, the two areas where courage is going to pop up the most would be courage to have those conversations that are sometimes difficult to have with your team mm -hmm. individually, and then courage to make a choice around, well, positioning obviously falls under that. And then like, this is who we want to work for and we're going to stick to our guns. And so the courage to have a point of view, to articulate it, to stick with it and to stand out in the marketplace that way. That's, that's what I mean by courage. Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, and again, I think that it's got to start with leadership. It's got to, you know, kind of start there and work its way down. And anybody else put into a, a leadership role has to walk the same walk. Um, can you talk a bit about what you you guys, you and your team do for positioning as far as helping agencies really uh, sure. hone in on how they how they do stand out and can own sure. their, their space? Sure. Um, so uh, I run the advisory side and there are two things that I do for most of our clients. Uh, one is a total business reset and then one is a new business audit. Uh, that's the smaller package. It takes three modules out of the total business reset and does those. So it's positioning, service offering design and lead gen. The positioning module is the one that's the least discreet in the sense that it's just open-ended. We have to figure out what the positioning is going to be and it doesn't matter how long that takes. So it, it comes down to, I guess why it's difficult and why it requires courage is that it's, it's really um, a process of exclusion in the sense that if you are unpositioned at this point, you're taking all kinds of opportunity and trying to turn it into money and, and impact. Mm -hmm. And so positioning is narrowing that down and say, okay, where am I? Like I'm good enough everywhere where I don't feel like I'm ripping any client off, but where am I really better? 
where have I seen more patterns in other places? Where can I make money? Where do I have my connections and so on? So we come up with several options. There are sometimes there's just one that we need to evaluate, but oftentimes there's two or three or four. And we just compare those, the pros and cons of each, especially if one is vertical and another one is horizontal, those carry very different promises and pitfalls. And then we test uh, them just there's five or six tests that you can apply to make sure that it's appropriate or, or even a good opportunity. And then we articulate it. So how are we going to say this in words specifically? I don't sign up to be the copywriter, but I can't, uh, because writing is something I enjoy doing. I usually can't resist that urge just to say, all right, forget it. Like, here's how we need to say this. What do you think? Give them something to interact with. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all comes down to. And it's, um, it, we're not, uh, I borrowed a phrase that Blair, my podcast partner uses in that we're not looking for a perfect positioning. We're looking for a perfectible positioning. That means that this is as close as we can get with the information we have at hand. We acknowledge and will actually welcome the fact that this will become clearer over time, a year, year and a half. And we'll tighten this a little bit or move it, migrate it a little bit. But this is a good working place to start with. And so that's the perfectible positioning. So that's that's what the process looks like. It takes, you know, we do usually weekly phone calls and it'll take three, four, five of those to get it right. And then, and then we move on to the rest of it. What's the testing like? Is that audience testing? Is that internal? Is it seeing what the competitors are doing? Do you not care about competitors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of it involves that for sure. It's it's quite scientific. So we test it against two sets of numbers. First of all, are there sufficient prospects, but not too many? Mm -hmm. uh, so usually it's really difficult to make a positioning with fewer than 2000 prospects work. That's just not because there's an assumption in professional services that you really can't safely count on locking up more than about 1% of the opportunity mm -hmm. and you need 15 to 20 clients at any given point. So 2000 minimum, and then it can get higher. You know, I start to get nervous around 10,000. And then we look at kind of the opposite side of that. And that's the competitive set. When you have a hundred or 200 competitors that should make you nervous. But if you have just single digit competitors, that should also make you nervous because you're either one of the first ones to the market, which is highly unlikely in, in what economists call an efficient marketplace. Mm -hmm. Or what's way more likely is that a lot of people have thought about it, tried it, and it didn't work. So there's just not, there's just insufficient opportunity if there aren't. So we want competitors, but not too many. We want a certain number of prospects, but not too many. So that you start with those two things and there's other ways to test it too. Yeah. You don't want to be the first one to break into whatever. I'm the long yeah. care advertising agency specialists or whatever. Yeah. Um, what, what, what about like the levers that you talk about pulling over time to further perfect this positioning as opposed to starting with it? Perfect. Yeah. Well, those levers are very analog. They're very soft. They're not all that scientific. It's simply in the marketplace, in the prospect stage and the client stage, how is your message, your message as you articulate it to them, how is it resonating with them? Mm. So you try on certain language and it either works or it doesn't, or somebody throws it back at you and says, Oh, I know what you're talking about. And they use a slightly different phrase, one that you wouldn't have thought of. Right. right. Like I'm working with a firm in Switzerland right now or Sweden, excuse me. And they're, um, they do product design for audio. And so, you know, there are certain phrases you, you don't talk about UX as much as you talk about human factors and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're testing all this stuff with people in the marketplace that really know about that. And then you just slightly adjust it. Or sometimes you don't lack, like in the early stages of positioning decision, you, you really need two things. You need information and you need courage. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you don't lack any courage. You've got you've got plenty of courage to make a decision. You just don't have enough information. That information comes to you later. And then you just, you already have the courage. You've already mustered that and you say, Oh, I can go even narrower now, but it's not that I, I was not courageous enough to do that before. I just didn't have the information to do that. Right.
Yeah. Do you think less information requires more courage, vice versa, or they're not really? Sure, it does. Um, it all really, you know, kind of the the mother load of deciding those things comes down to addressability. Hmm. If we might come up with a really brilliant positioning, often it's more of a horizontal one, but we cannot we can't solve the addressability issue, and so sometimes that's the final thing. It's like, is this, if, if this is going to work, we're going to have to figure out a way to address these people. Do they gather, are, do they share similar enough um, things that keep them awake at light at night that, mm-hmm. that somebody else has, has shaped a solution to solve this? It's like, you know, there's lots of, a lot of complexity. It's actually fun. I, I enjoy it. I would hope you enjoy it doing it for 30 years. I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> you want to be strapped <laughs> to a desk miserable that long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Blair, so you mentioned Blair, uh, AKA your podcast partner, AKA Blair mm-hmm. ends, uh, from when without pitching manifesto. Um, I was introduced to that probably about 10 years ago. I think it's brilliant. Um, he talks about, uh, different legs of the stool as far as like niching. Like, do you also subscribe to that methodology of like, you know, owning a few verticals or, you know, how does that play into your strategy? Uh, so, you can probably solve that by using those same numbers. So like in the early days, you could have focused in tech or healthcare or financial services, but those have become so broad anymore that they're almost meaningless. You have to mm-hmm. focus a lot narrower. He defines positioning differently than I do. He, he defines it as discipline for market. Yeah. So you do this for this which works, um, except that, uh, I like to account for the fact that you have to define that differently for, for vertical versus horizontal. So for a, for a horizontal positioning, the focus is on discipline for market for a vertical one. It's, it's discipline for market. Um, but we, he understands positioning exceedingly well, he and his team, and, uh, we're on the same page about positioning. That must be a Canadian thing. I don't know if <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, he pronounces things weird too. Yeah, that he does. Yeah, for sure. Um, you don't touch the M and A side too much. Um, I built friend? our M and A practice. Uh, I think that started about six or seven years in, not because I knew anything about it, but because my clients who already trusted me said, "Hey, can you help me with this?" And so it was mm-hmm. like drinking from a water hose. We've now, between the two of us, we've done uh, one hundred and seventy plus transactions. Wow. But it was way too big for me. And so I wanted to bring somebody in to, to build that and manage it. So that's a full-time job. So um, I helped develop our our first methodology for valuation. He's expanded that and he does all of that work. Uh, I don't even look at it. If he has a question or something, then I help him just like I will ask for his help from time to time. And we fill in for me for each other when there are vacations and so on. But yeah, I don't, I don't really touch the M and a stuff. He does all that now. Yeah. And so episode 70, I think of my podcast comes out today or tomorrow featuring uh, Jonathan um, from punctuation as well. So we'll get yeah. to the, the, the double sided duo. So, so think, all right. So we've, we've covered like the difference of what you think takes an agency from good to great um, and all the factors in, included there, as well as like some of the top level uh, cornerstones of positioning, but leading to the age old question of, man, I'd love to sell this agency one day. Um, and you guys do a ton of valuations, um, taking it from great to something that is acquirable more than just an aqua hire. Like what are some of those key factors that you see? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I should clarify too, that even if, because most firms don't sell, mm-hmm. uh, even considering that though, even taking that into account, we think you ought to run your firm as if you're going to sell it because that forces you to run it in a way that means you're even less likely to need to sell it because it's running really well. Right. So those are things like having a great uh, level right below you, a management team. It means having really accurate financials. It means keeping all of the ratios in play so that you can significantly, so you can expect significant profit regularly. It means your positioning is tied into that. So really everything I do on the advisory side is whether somebody wants to sell their firm or not, 
it helps improve their chances of selling a firm. So I view my advisory work as leading straight into M&A if somebody needs it. If they don't need it, fine, because you just you should still make these choices. Service offering design, how you uh, build client relationships so that it looks less project to project e to a buyer. Um, what else? Um, I think, you know, having a, oh, I know a really important one is having a scalable new business system mm. so that when the potential buyer asks you about it, you say, oh yeah, this is how we do it. This is how we fill the top of the funnel. This is how we move them down. This is the percentage we convert. So just having your, having a system in place and being very intentional about it, all of those things help you in a selling situation, but they're also the kind of things you be, you should be doing anyway, really. I'm, I don't know if you can see it. Listeners won't be able to see it. I'm grinning kind of ear to ear because I love that you said that and positioned it the way that you did, because I've had a handful of agencies come to me uh, in the, in the time that I've been coaching and say, love to be able to sell this thing. And, and the key factors that we work towards them having in place are exactly what you said of now that I'm here, I don't want to sell it because I can, you know, work 20 hours a week and still make a great living. And it's not a shit show like it was or like whatever those things are. But now it's operating in a way that makes sense and is attractive for sale if I still want to go through that execution. But mm -hmm. so far, none of them have wanted to take it that far. Um, so, you know, same, same viewpoint of run it like you want to sell it and you probably won't want to sell it because it'll be running really well. And right. so, yeah, right. I love that. Yeah, I think John Warlow uh, really popularized that idea in his book, Built to Sell. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapters in that book uses an agency as an example. And so yeah. it kind of caught on with, oh, we should build these things to sell them, even if we don't sell them. It's funny because I, I read that. I read that book. I took a solo camping trip one weekend. I was running my agency and took that book back to the shop and said, we need to make some serious changes. And that inspired a lot of big changes in my agency that did lead to selling it. But, you know, the niching down, the saying no, you know, like, you know, pricing structure, account management structure, a lot of those things were really valuable. So that right. was a, a, a game changer for my agency, that book. Um, so real quick, I want to shift gears, keep it on schedule and, and drop a couple of rapid fire questions on you that the answers to which may may have they don't have to have anything to do with agencies. They can be personal, professional, digital or physical. Um, mm -hmm. And that'll make sure. sense as we get into it. So the first is what is something that, you know, a, a hobby, a book, a show that you just can't get enough of these days? Oh, well, woodworking and motorcycle uh, teaching racing has I think I'm going to give up the teaching side, but uh, motorcycling and woodworking and photography are the things that for my entire life I've done and I can't get enough of those. So hmm. for sure. Yeah. What kind of bikes are you racing? Uh, I've had many, many different bikes at the moment. Uh, well, I had five recently I'd sold all of them and I just repurchased a BMW street naked street bike. And that's what I'm, it's just stock. Um, so, but I was sponsored by Kawasaki for a while when I was teaching through the Superbike school. So lots of different bikes there, you know, you can, if you can ride a motorcycle, you can ride anything. Yeah. Awesome. I, I love it. We just got into riding about six or seven years ago and what a rush. It's such a thrill, but I'm not a competitive rider or, you know, track rider or anything like that, but still a lot of fun. Um, what is a tool that you recently integrated into your life? Again, digital, physical, professional, personal, that you look back and you're, you say, how the heck did I live without this thing for so long? Yeah, a tool. Hmm. Uh, well, I've got too many tools, so I, and I buy too many cameras. I One camera I bought recently I really have enjoyed because it's very simple, is a Leica 3, uh, hmm. Q3, which is, uh, it's just got a fixed lens on it. I think it's a 28 or a 24 and it's uh, out of focus. I just carry it around and just, I don't think about the camera. I just capture stuff. So probably the Q3 is the most recent tool I'm really enjoying. I just watched a documentary on Leica. It was just so eye opening. It was brilliant. What a, what a really great culture. And yeah. Great company. It's a great and, brand. Great yeah. brand. Uh, and then finally, you know, in this, you know, um, yeah, answer it how you will. What is just an absolutely invaluable piece of business advice that you can share with agency owners that are listening? So 
stopping things is just as important as starting things. So it's really, it feels great to start things and then your life gets complicated. And I feel like anything you start ought to be for a season and maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 10 months, but stop things and simplify them, get meetings out, get fixed meetings out of your life. It's just like, man, there's just, your life can just get cluttered so fast. So just stop a lot of things, be reckless about it. Just pick something and stop it. What's right. the indicator on what to stop? Well, probably don't pick your marriage. That's probably not a bad <laughs> plan, but <laughs> something that, you know, it's just, you start to dread it. Like, yeah. like, okay, well just stop it. Then reinvent it. Like think about it differently. So it's uh, I think people in this field too are particularly susceptible to boredom. And so they almost need that extra stimulation to start and stop things. So take advantage of it. Yeah, I love it. That's really sage advice. Um, especially we, we also tend to get caught up in ruts uh, all too often. That's just how we've been doing it. So pick something yeah. and stop it. Cool. Hey, David, I really appreciate your time. Really appreciate, again, you kind of paving the path for what myself and, you know, so many other people are doing in our industry and um, all, all of the valuable content you share on two bobs and on your website and in some of the agency groups that we're in. So again, I'm really grateful for your time and, and thank you for uh, being here. Thanks for having me, Steve. Thanks again for tuning in to agency bites. If you know someone with expert knowledge on a topic that agency owners would love to hear about, go to agencyoutsite.com forward slash podcast dash guest and nominate them. 